The February Revolution was one without an insurrection. The people rose and Tsardom was ousted. The provisional government was created in response to the pressure from the Soviets and the unprepared capitalists inherited power from Tsardom. Things seemed relatively good in the beginning and people celebrated the collapse of the previous regime. The provisional government changed form and personnel multiple times, going from the first to the second to the third, but Kerensky was always in it. The first form was made up of 10 capitalist ministers and one socialist revolutionary, Kerensky. The second had 10 capitalist ministers and six labor, Mensheviks and SRs, with Kerensky as the war minister. The 10 capitalist ministers resigned following what would become known as the July Offensive, ending the first coalition government and leaving the SRs and Mensheviks. Quote, the more difficult the situation became for the capitalists, the more dependent they became on the labor movement to save the situation. Murphy. The second coalition government were the ones who embarked on a smear campaign against Lenin, claiming he was a German spy and harshly repressed anti-war protests in the capital. After this, the third coalition government came about in August, headed by Kerensky as president and minister of war. It had a majority of Mensheviks and SRs, plus a number of cadet party members. This government was created on the condition that the labor ministers were independent from the Soviets. Following this, the provisional government set about trying to destroy them. Quote, it was to secure a wider democratic basis for this latter purpose that the provisional government, with the executive committee of the Congress of Soviets, called a state conference of selected bodies. The representations consisted of an overwhelming majority of generals, capitalists, and their supporters, and the conference proved a means for General Kornilov to gather his forces for an attempt to establish a military dictatorship which would end both the Kerensky regime and the Soviets. Ibid. Some of the Soviets, influenced by the Bolsheviks, impeded this plan. The provisional government staged a democratic conference in place of a state conference, after Kerensky tried to set up his own thing based on Kornilov's. This all-in democratic conference was caused by a leftward swing in the country. Lenin wrote of the democratic conference, quote, During a revolution, Millions and tens of millions learn in a week more than they do in a year of their ordinary somnolent life. For during a severe crisis in the life of the people, it becomes particularly apparent what aims the various classes of people are pursuing, what forces they control, and what methods they resort to in action. Ibid. The mixed capitalist and feudal economy could not meet the demands of the war, as it necessitated the kind of output provided by a modern industrial country. Lack of equipment and food were withering away the army, peasants were hoarding food because they weren't receiving value for their goods, and workers were ceasing their work due to the rising difficulty in obtaining food. Quote, and week by week the economic situation moved on to catastrophe. Ibid. With no regard for the economic crisis, the provisional government tried to stage an offensive in July, and it was disastrous. It angered the people and the lacking supplies at the front added to the demoralization and disaffection of the army. Quote, Whatever the critics of Bolshevism may say, it has to be admitted that they not only saw the possibility of such a situation, but pursued a policy based on possibility becoming probability, and probability becoming certainty. They had put Marxism to the test of practice, and under Lenin's leadership, it had proved reliable. Ibid. On May 7th to 12th, the All-Russian Congress of the Bolshevik Party was held, with 151 delegates who represented 80,000 members across the country. This was the last legal congress before the October Revolution. Lenin won the fight for his April theses over the Kamenev and Rykov-led opposition, making them the party line. Stalin was re-elected to the Central Committee and to the newly created Political Bureau of the Central Committee, which he would remain a member of for many years to come. He was also one of three secretaries, and an editor for the party paper, Pravda. There were two other secretaries, Sverdlov and Zerzhinsky. Sverdlov was in his 30s, and was a founding member of the party, and Zerzhinsky, who was Polish, was around 45. Lenin was around 47 at the time, and Stalin around 38. Quote, he, Stalin, and his fellow leaders were tireless in their labors and completely absorbed by them. They were in action day and night, sleeping only when forced to break off from sheer exhaustion. Ibid. Over eight months, Bolshevik membership would grow from roughly 80,000 to 300,000. 
these people all had to be organized for work. When Stalin could sleep, it was at the Alleluia's home for most of the time he was in Petrograd, but his days and nights were filled with numerous party tasks. Around this time, the provisional government announced its adherence to the war aims of the Tsar. This displeased the people, who had been hoping for peace negotiations, and soldiers and workers marched against the war policy. However, the middle groupings, officers, and gentry had a march of their own supporting the government, led by the cadet party. The largely SR and Menshevik comprised Soviets forced the foreign minister, Milyukov, and war minister, Guchkov, to resign. This was not because the Mensheviks and SRs were against the war, they tended not to be, but because of the overtly imperialist nature of the speeches. Kerensky became Minister of War and began preparations for the July Offensive. People in the capital shouted things like, Down with the ten capitalist ministers! All power to the Soviets of workers and soldiers and peasant deputies! Bread! Peace! Freedom! Ibit. The offensive on July 1st, of course, resulted in disaster, demonstrations, and the resignation of the ten capitalist ministers. The Bolsheviks pointed out that the provisional government were just continuing the policies of the Tsar. People in Petrograd especially were angry and militant, and the cadets and officers, who still had military strength, were waiting for the government to repress them. They were also hoping the Bolsheviks would call for insurrection, as the government was still tied to the Soviets, and its party still had a majority. If they had, they would have been leading the masses against not just the government, but the Soviets as well. The cadets and officers would then use this as an excuse to restore order with a military dictatorship. Basically, the Mensheviks and SRs would start the counter-revolution, and the cadets and militarists would finish it. Roughly 500,000 armed soldiers, sailors, and workers took to the streets of Petrograd. Stalin said that on July 16th, New Style, quote, there was a city conference of Bolsheviks discussing municipal questions. It was interrupted by a soldier from a machine gun regiment informing them that workers and soldiers had decided to rise and were sending out delegates to the regiments and factories. At four o'clock, the Central Committee under Lenin's chairmanship meant to decide the course of the Bolsheviks. It decided against action. I was commissioned to carry the decision to the session of the Executive Committee of the Soviets. I conveyed all the facts. I proposed that they take the necessary measures. At 5 o'clock, the city conference adopted a similar resolution. All participants went to their districts and factories to restrain the masses from rising. At 7 o'clock, two regiments appeared outside the party's headquarters, carrying banners reading, All power to the Soviets. Two of our comrades came out to persuade the soldiers to return to the barracks. They were met with cries of, Down! This had never happened before. At this time, a procession of workers came up, with the cry, All power to the Soviets. Ibid. People felt they were ready for an uprising, but the time wasn't right yet. Lenin and the Bolsheviks knew that if they didn't lead things, they'd lose the confidences of the masses for a time, but they didn't have a majority in the Petrograd or Moscow Soviets, and the peasants were still following the Mensheviks and SRs. Stalin was the one who negotiated with the Soviet executive and made it clear they were not rising against the Soviets, and who persuaded rebel soldiers to vacate their posts at the Peter and Paul Fortress. Thanks to this, the Bolsheviks turned a large, spontaneous uprising into peaceful demonstrations, though there were some street fights. However, the government fired on the demonstrators. They also declared martial law, and by July 19th were going after the Bolsheviks and the demonstrators in general. The former were deemed responsible for the situation and accused of attempted insurrection, and they began their campaign of claiming Lenin was a German spy. Party headquarters was trashed, and Pravda was closed down its offices raided and printing press smashed. There were many arrests, and the government was after Lenin, who stayed at Stalin's room in the Alleluyev home for a while, as did Zinoviev. Stalin and Alleluyev escorted, and guarded, a disguised Lenin and Zinoviev to a train that took them to a prearranged hiding spot, the small town of Sestroretsk, on the Gulf of Finland. The government's campaign accusing them of being pro-German was stirring people up so much that if caught, they likely would have been lynched before they could be taken to prison. Quote, the Volinsky Regiment, which had been the first to participate in the revolutionary uprisings of March, was so inflamed that it pledged itself to effect their arrest. Murphy. The responsibility for leading the party fell on Stalin, aided by Sverdlov and Zerzhinsky. They secured new headquarters and a new printing press, and put out Pravda under a different title.
Trotsky arrived in Petrograd following the party's April crisis, and along with his small group of followers, called Mezrayansi, proclaimed he agreed with Lenin. Trotsky supported the Bolsheviks in meetings of the Petrograd Soviet, but when the provisional government attacked the Bolsheviks, they left him alone. He again said he supported Lenin's policies, and even asked to be arrested, and he was arrested and put in prison. Quote, This had its publicity value for him and increased his popularity among the masses, but it cannot be said that it gave leadership to those masses, or helped in any way to carry out the stupendous task of reassembling the Bolshevik forces, and developing their organization under the provisional government's repressive blows. Ibid. Not putting himself in the spotlight was an asset for Stalin, with his enemies underestimating his power and providing him more freedom of movement. Prior to the government's attack, the party had increased to 240,000 members and had 41 publications, 29 in Russian and 12 in other languages. Despite the conditions, Stalin and the other secretaries organized the Sixth Party Congress, held illegally in early August, 267 delegates attending. They had also managed to put out a replacement for Pravda, called Worker and Soldier. The Mensheviks and SRs were repressing the Bolsheviks and trying to take down the Soviets, and military leaders under General Kornilov were preparing for military dictatorship. But the Congress of Bolsheviks continued their progress. In the Central Committee's report, Stalin described the provisional government as, quote, a puppet, a miserable screen behind which stand the cadets, the military clique, and allied capital, three pillars of counter-revolution. Gray. During discussions on the final part of the draft resolution, Stalin argued against a proposal that socialist construction was only possible, quote, in the event of a proletarian revolution in the West. He said that, quote, the possibility is not excluded that Russia will be the country that will lay the road to socialism. We must discard the antiquated idea that only Europe can show us the way. There is dogmatic Marxism and creative Marxism. I stand by the latter. Lenin also did not cling to the widespread dogma that they were dependent on the West for socialist revolution and shared this position. He wrote the previous year, quote, The development of capitalism proceeds extremely unevenly in different countries. It cannot be otherwise under commodity production. From this it follows irrefutably that socialism cannot achieve victory simultaneously in all countries. It will achieve victory first in one or several countries. Around this time, there were some 20,000 Red Guards in Petrograd, and membership was actually fairly strong. The July Days and Smear campaign ended up being only minor setbacks. The people now supported the Bolsheviks even more. Stalin summed things up speaking at the Congress. Quote, only one thing remains, namely, to take power by force, by overthrowing the provisional government, and only the proletariat, in alliance with the poor peasants, can take power by force. Murphy The government had not addressed any of the issues related to the revolution, the food problem, or the war. The masses would soon look to the Bolsheviks for leadership. Trotsky and the Mezrayansi, former Bolsheviks and Mensheviks who had vacillated between the two, now said they supported the policy and program of the Bolsheviks and requested to join the party. On Stalin's proposal and Lenin's approval, they were admitted. Murphy wrote of this, quote, It would appear at first that Trotsky here brought to an end his 15 years quarrel with the Bolsheviks by admitting that they were right and he wrong. Such a conclusion, however, oversimplifies the meaning of the event. Describing Trotsky's traits, he said they, quote, reflected the superb egotist who saw history as a drama staged to show him as producer, manager, and leading actor. He would eventually write history based on the theme, I and the Russian Revolution. He had a great capacity for generalization, but lacked the balance imparted by the scientific method, and therefore often generalized too soon and short-circuited history with grand phrases. Ibid. He went on to say that, quote, he regarded his joining as a means of acquiring power over the party and becoming second-in-command to Lenin. He himself wrote of the action in words which are very self-revealing. Quote, Trotsky came to Lenin as to a teacher whose power and significance he understood later than many others, but perhaps more fully than they. A less conceited person would have left the latter observation to others. The egotist could not wait. Ibid. He contrasted these features with Stalin who had a great capacity for waiting, and may have appeared to move more slowly, quote, perhaps because he was not interested in firework displays or mental gymnastics, Ibid. He also said that, quote, he had, and has, 
a remarkable memory, and analysis is his favorite method of exposition. Above all, he is a collective worker. He was by no means a yes-man of Lenin, but a convinced disciple, striving always to make Lenin's principles his own. He lacked the refinements of those who, while he organized the submerged proletariat of the Caucasus, and was laying the fuses of the revolution in hard and difficult places, had rubbed shoulders with Western intellectuals. Ibid. General Kornilov was made commander-in-chief of Russia's military on August 1st, 1917 and demanded the death penalty be instituted both in the rear and at the front. He was also planning a military dictatorship with himself as dictator. On August 12th, Kerensky called together a council of state in Moscow, made up almost entirely of representatives of the landlords, capitalists, generals, officers, and Cossacks, though there were a small number of SRs and Mensheviks representing the Soviets. Stalin and the Bolsheviks led strikes in Moscow and other cities. Kerensky bragged that he would suppress the movement, quote, by iron and blood, and Kornilov demanded that, quote, the committees and Soviets be abolished, Ibid. He was financially backed by bankers, merchants, and manufacturers, and gathered his troops on the claim the Bolsheviks were plotting an uprising for August 27th. Kerensky stepped up his actions against the Bolsheviks, but changed course and turned against Kornilov after becoming alarmed at the movement of the masses. On August 25th, Kornilov dispatched the 3rd Mounted Corps under General Krymos to Petrograd. Lenin directed things from safety, but Stalin implemented them and made the further decisions that needed to be made. When Kornilov began moving his troops, the party central committee called workers and soldiers to armed resistance, and the number of Red Guards increased quickly. Trade unions and sailors came also. The Cossack troops refused to continue when they realized they were being sent to attack the Soviets and preparations for the armed defense of the city proceeded. Kerensky was now even asking the Bolsheviks for help against Kornilov, and had released Bolshevik prisoners. Kornilov's plan fell apart, thanks to the defense of the city by Red Guards and the strike of railway workers, who refused to transport Kornilov's troops. The tide also changed in the Soviets. Factories and military units elected Bolsheviks, and the Bolsheviks attained a majority in the Petrograd Soviet in September soon followed by Moscow and other cities. In September and October, peasants took over estates, pushed out landlords, plowed their fields, and distributed land among themselves. The provisional government wired to officials, quote, seizures of property are damaging the cause of the revolution. Put a stop to it and bring about order. A government minister named Shingarov replied, quote, the solution of the land question without legal enactment by the government as a whole cannot be permitted. Murphy. Of course, their laws were not going to stop anything. The Commissar of Kursk County reported, quote, In the village of Ipsyagak, in the Spass district, anarchy reigns supreme. The peasants are storming the gardens and looting. Resistance was offered the Commissar and 50 soldiers. The owners, who have fled, ask for protection. Ibid. There was a report from the province of Tambovsk about what happened to Prince Vnezinsky and his property. Quote, 2,000 peasants stormed the grounds and arrested the prince. He was guarded by three militiamen chosen by the crowd, who took him to Grais, where he was brutally murdered by the soldiers. The crowd then destroyed the adjacent grounds of Velya Manach. The local garrison is unreliable. The dragoons sent from Tambovsk are insufficient. Unrest is growing. Ibid. 35 of the 75 districts in the central province were affected by violent movements. Conditions were also worsening in terms of the economy and industry. From 1916 to 1917, the budget deficit went from 76% of total expenditure to 82%. In 1916, the country produced 616 normal-use locomotives and 215 for war purposes, but only 410 and 69 respectively in 1917. In 58 provinces, industry production in 1916 was 121.5% of 1913 levels, but fell to 77.3% in 1917. In industry, wages fell from 24.7 rubles a month in 1916 to 21.2 in 1917. 288.1 million paper rubles were issued monthly in 1916, but during the eight months of the provisional government, this rose to 1.175 billion a month. The price index of the Finance Commissariat in Moscow showed 1917 prices to be 870% higher than in 1913. The army wasn't doing well either, and in August 1917, 
General Duconin reported 2 million dead, 5 million wounded, 2 million taken prisoner, and 2 million deserters. Back home, food was scarce, and people waited in long lines for necessities. Some even had armed guards watch over their homes in case a hungry person tried to break in. On top of this, the weather is often gloomy in Petrograd during this time of year. The skies are dull and gray, the daylight shortens, and it rains frequently, eventually turning to sleet and then snow. Murphy wrote that, despite everything, quote, the parasitic elements of society carried on as usual, though perhaps a little more hectically. But virtually everywhere, there were always meetings, demonstrations, protests, conferences, gatherings, and even assemblies of soldiers in the trenches and barracks. The Petrograd Soviet had taken over a former school for the Daughters of Ladies called Smolny Institute, and it became Bolshevik headquarters. Stalin visited Lenin in Finland, where they worked out plans for the insurrection. When he got back, the Central Committee created a military revolutionary committee made up of Stalin, Sverdlov, Bubnov, Yuritsky, and Zerzhinsky, which had to prepare for the upcoming events in Petrograd, Moscow, and elsewhere. Stalin helped secure arms. Quote, Stalin did not repeat the tactics of the St. Petersburg Soviet of 1905 and call upon the government to form a militia under the local authorities. Instead, he called a conference of the Bolshevik delegates of the Putilov Arms Factory in Petrograd and gave them on behalf of the Petrograd Soviet a written requisition for 5,000 rifles. A deputation of 500 militant workmen presented the order to their management and received immediate delivery. Ibid. In Pravda, he encouraged deserters from the army to become Red Guards. The concerned Mensheviks and SRs held an all-Russian democratic conference and still clung to the idea that power should go to a constituent assembly and bourgeois parliamentary republic. Present were representatives of the Mensheviks, SRs, Soviets where attending parties had a majority, Zemstvos, trade unions, and commercial, industrial, and military circles. They set up the Provisional Council of the Republic, also known as the Pre-Parliament, which was a clear attempt to halt the revolution. But it wasn't going to accomplish anything, certainly not the peace, land, and bread that the people wanted. The Bolshevik CC decided to boycott the pre-parliament, though a small group of Bolsheviks did appear, but were withdrawn on the fourth day, as the majority felt it was now all or nothing. A second Kornilov affair was brewing behind the scenes, and there could be no more delays. The Bolsheviks had a majority in the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets, and were planning for the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets. Lenin returned on October 20th, New Style, and on the 23rd, the CC decided that, quote, considering therefore that an armed uprising is inevitable and that the time for it is fully ripe, the Central Committee instructs all the party organizations to be guided accordingly and to discuss and decide all practical questions from this point of view. Kamenev and Zinovia voted against this, calling it adventurism. Trotsky abstained and proposed that the insurrection shouldn't begin before the Second Congress of Soviets. A non-party paper was published featuring Kamenev, speaking for himself and Zinoviev, denouncing the proposed insurrection, which made the plot public. Lenin was understandably furious, as were others, and called them traitors and strikebreakers, saying they should be expelled from the party. Murphy. Many of the others, including Trotsky, who was Kamenev's brother-in-law, felt the same way. However, Stalin argued for tolerance, and the proposal was dropped. They decided to expel Kamenev from the editorial board of Pravda, but Stalin resigned in protest, and the committee, refusing his resignation, dropped this proposal too. A military committee was set up by the Petrograd Soviet on October 25th, with Trotsky as chairman, but it was made up of Bolsheviks who answered to the political bureau, via Stalin. On October 29th, a special military revolutionary center was established. Stalin was among its five members, but Trotsky was not. This center, quote, has been described as the real organizing force of the revolution, Gray. The publicity made a delay even more dangerous. After a meeting to decide what to do about the Bolsheviks, the provisional government transferred soldiers from the front to Petrograd on November 1st in order for them to seize the Smolny Institute. But it was too late. Stalin, Sverdlov, Zerzhinsky, Trotsky, and Yuritsky were at their posts. Kerensky ordered the Bolshevik press suppressed on November 6th, and sent armored cars. They apparently destroyed some equipment and papers, but Murphy wrote that they were driven off by Red Guards, mobilized by Stalin, who stood guard over the press. On November 6th, Stalin wrote in the party paper, Robochi put, 
meaning the workers' path, in part, quote, After the victory of the February Revolution, power remained in the hands of the landlords and capitalists, the bankers and speculators, the profiteers and marauders. Therein lay the fatal mistake of the workers and soldiers. That is the cause of the present disasters in the rear and at the front. This mistake must be rectified at once. The time has come when further procrastination is fraught with disaster for the whole cause of the revolution. The present government of landlords and capitalists must be replaced by a new government, a government of workers and peasants. The present imposter government, which was not elected by the people and which is not accountable to the people, must be replaced by a government recognized by the people, elected by the representatives of the workers, soldiers and peasants, and accountable to these representatives. The Kishkin Konovalov government must be replaced by a government of the Soviet of workers, soldiers, and peasants deputies. That which was not done in February must be done now. Thus, and thus alone, can peace, bread, land, and liberty be won. Workers, soldiers, peasants, Cossacks, and all working people, do you want the present government of landlords and capitalists to be replaced by a new government, a government of workers and peasants? Do you want the new government of Russia to proclaim in conformity with the demands of the peasants, the abolition of landlordism, and to transfer all the landed estates to the peasant committees without compensation? Do you want the new government of Russia to publish the Tsar's secret treaties, to declare them invalid, and to propose a just peace to all the belligerent nations? Do you want the new government of Russia to put a thorough curb on the organizers of lockouts, and the profiteers who are deliberately fomenting famine and unemployment, economic disruption and high prices? If you want this, Muster all your forces, rise as one man, organize meetings, and elect your delegations and, through them, lay your demands before the Congress of Soviets which opens tomorrow in the Smolny. If you all act solidly and staunchly, no one will dare to resist the will of the people. The stronger and the more organized and powerful your action, the more peacefully will the old government make way for the new. And then the whole country will boldly and firmly march toward to the conquest of peace for the peoples, land for the peasants, and bread and work for the starving. Robochi Put called for the overthrow of the provisional government, marking the beginning of the insurrection. On November 7th, Red Guards, along with revolutionary soldiers from the Petrograd garrison, which had been captured by the Bolsheviks, and the Kronstadt sailors, took up their positions. Train stations, post office, telegraph office, the ministries, and the state bank were occupied, and the cruiser Aurora fired its shot as a signal before aiming its guns at the Winter Palace. Lenin went to headquarters, Smolny, and, with Stalin, took charge of the situation. The Bolsheviks had control of the whole city, apart from the Winter Palace, by early afternoon. In fact, at 10 a.m., Lenin wrote, quote, The provisional government has been deposed. State power has passed into the hands of the organ of the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, the Revolutionary Military Committee, which heads the Petrograd proletariat and the garrison, the cause for which the people have fought, namely, the immediate offer of a democratic peace, the abolition of landed proprietorship, workers' control over production, and the establishment of Soviet power. This cause has been secured. Long live the revolution of workers, soldiers, and peasants. Revolutionary Military Committee of the Petrograd Soviet of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies. At 2.35 p.m., Trotsky and the MRC of the Petrograd Soviet announced to the deputies, Quote, I declare in the name of the Military Revolutionary Committee that the provisional government has ceased to exist. Some ministers are arrested. The rest will be arrested in the next few days or hours. The Revolutionary Garrison, which is under the command of Military Revolutionary Committee, has dissolved the meeting of the pre-parliament. It has been said that the rising of the garrison would at least lead to pogroms and that the revolution would be drowned in blood. To the best of our knowledge, there has not been a single victim. There is no other example of a revolution known to me in history in which such great masses took part and which was so bloodless. The power of the provisional government, with Kerensky at its head, was dead and was only waiting for the broom of history to sweep it away. Murphy. Gray noted that, quote, the swift, almost bloodless capture of Petrograd set a pattern which was followed throughout most of the country. There were some exceptions though, including the capture of Moscow, achieved on November 15th, where there was severe fighting. Kerensky had apparently fled Petrograd in an American car. While Trotsky and then Lenin were addressing the Petrograd Soviet, quote, Stalin was directing the revolutionary armed contingents to all the decisive points of the city, Murphy. His activities, like Lenin's, were probably mostly behind the scenes, 
He may not have been in the limelight, but, as usual, he played a large role. Ray wrote that, quote, It is probable that they stood back from the event so that they would be ready to continue the struggle if the insurrection failed. But, of course, it succeeded. Soldiers held up traffic on Nevsky Prospect at 3.15 p.m., and MRC troops seized Kazan Square at 3.45. At 6, the Winter Palace was taken, and at 10.45, the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets began at the Smolny Institute. Delegates of Soviets from around the country were in attendance. When Lenin stepped onto the platform, he was met with the, quote, seemingly never-ending ovation, Murphy. When it finally died down, he proclaimed, we shall now proceed to construct the socialist order.